What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Mike Zuniga Films Podcast. In this episode, I have with me Kenny Dennis. He's a digital marketer and entrepreneur. Kenny shares how he got his start in business after graduating college, the importance of trusting in your decisions, to how filmmakers and creatives can earn additional revenue on top of their current projects. So without further ado, Kenny Dennis. How's it going? I'm good, dude. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for being on the podcast. No, thank you for having me, man. I mean, I remember when I first did the podcast for you, we talked about the leadership principles. It was mm-hmm. a little bit, a little tidbit of kind of what we're diving into today, but I think we're going to get the full course meal today and I'm super excited and yeah. uh, I know your audience is hungry for it, so it should be cool. Yeah, I'm excited as well. And so for all of you that are watching right now, all of you that are listening, I've known Kenny for a long time since yep. high school. Super long time. Yeah. And we didn't start uh, we i mean i kept tabs on what you were right, doing right it was during um, college time during college time and right. then after we graduated uh that's when we linked up and yep. started doing business together Absolutely. and it's been history ever since yeah no i saw you killing it with the video and kind of what you were doing and i was in the lifestyle space media and e-commerce and i was just seeing these amazing videos that you were creating i was like dude i gotta link up with this guy that's when facebook um was really starting to push video yeah and you're the first person i called and it's been history ever since i appreciate man yeah, thanks absolutely. for the love man. of course man yeah so um first off i want to start with fashion because that's yep that's something that you are mm-hmm. interested in and I, I known you to be always like fashionable for sure so what got you into fashion? You know, it's funny, man. When I was in high school, people gave me the nickname KRD Fresh. And that was my nickname I kind of rolled with all throughout high school. And people just kind of knew me by that. And fashion for me, when I first started really dressing well in high school, it was just a way for me to stand out mm-hmm. more than anything. I was a football player. I saw a whole bunch of different styles online. It just interests me for some odd reason. I'm not sure why, but I kind of fell in love with it. And when I left high school and I wasn't able to play football anymore, I kind of needed to dig my teeth into something. Mm -hmm. You know, being a type A personality who's always trying to achieve something. Right. You know, I wanted to really do something great. And um, I started to think to myself, I was like, dude, what do what's one thing that I know that I'm extremely good at? Mm -hmm. You know, I was never the huge A plus student or honor degree or anything like that. I was just a hard fucking worker, period. Yeah. So I said, I was thinking to myself, I was like, damn, dude, I've always dressed well. And this was around the time when Karma Loop was really starting to come up. And that's an online streetwear retailer who sold BBC. They sold um, Diamond Supply when it was coming up, the hundreds, all that type of stuff. And they were one of the really, one of the only big players in that space. Mm -hmm. And for me, I saw an opportunity. I was like, wow, you know, let me start a retailer. One thing I do know is business. My mom's been in business for over 20 plus years, taught me everything. Mm -hmm. And being 19 years old and young and stupid, I was like, yo, let me just start a retailer, buy some product, throw it up on a website and let's just get the fucking thing rolling. Yeah. So I I did that, bought a shit ton of inventory. We work with companies like Wes, uh, Lyra, uh, Mink Pink. Uh, Monday clothing, a whole bunch of different clothing brands for women and men. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a hell of a ride. You know, we threw it up there. We had to grow our social media. We had to figure out how to get traffic to the website. It was just, uh, it was an era for sure. It was an era for sure. So it was fun. So that kind of, I mean, I guess that kind of transitioned you into what you were doing with Raken and all that. And I want to talk about that later on, but kind of like, Go back a little bit. Like, what's your story? How did you get into entrepreneurship? Were you always business minded since you were young? Um, I would say for me, um, yeah, I suppose so. I've always been around business. So mm-hmm. for me, my mom, she owns a uh, tax and accounting firm. So since I was, you know, eight or nine years old and being around her, she, I was, you know, I saw the transition of her starting her business in the house and being on her lap when she was doing tax returns all the way up to the point now where she's been featured on KTLA and doing incredible things and have a large 10,000 square foot office and different things like that. So for me, I wasn't necessarily, um, I didn't necessarily know I was an entrepreneur. I was, when I first started, when I was younger, I was Mm -hmm. actually a shy person, a really shy person. Mm -hmm. 
and I didn't really grow out of my shell until I started the business. So for me, I didn't, I didn't know I was an entrepreneur. I just saw an opportunity to make money. I was a hard worker. Yeah. And I guess, you know, my natural tendency started to come out of that entrepreneurial gene without me really even knowing it, you know? So it was, it was incredible. So I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think for entrepreneurship, do I think that you're born with it? I think, um, I think a lot of it is DNA for sure. And half of it's just extremely hard work to be 110% with you. 50, 50. Yeah. 50, 50 for sure. 50, 50. Absolutely. Nice. So, um, what was, what was like the, what was your experience in college? Okay. Did you take any business classes? So when I first went to college, I originally went to college to be a physical therapist. Mm -hmm. So I was an ex football player. That's what I knew. And uh, kind of being a young guy, you kind of go into college, you know, not really knowing what to do. And that was probably the most best thing I probably knew mm -hmm. at that moment in time. So I went into physical therapy. I remember taking my first anatomy class and it was just, dude, it made my fucking head spin. Like it was just the terms, the this, the that. It was just nuts. Like I could not keep up with it. Mm -hmm. I ended up getting an F my first semester in that anatomy class. And it was oh, just, man. it was it was horrible, man. Yeah. So I remember I said, all right, let me just keep up with it. I ended up doing a genetics class, failed the hell out of that class. I had to drop that class. It was just too tough. And um, we were required to take different classes. And I remember taking this marketing class and it was almost like everything made sense in that class from the way that you have to target cer certain customers, putting products in front of them that they like and enjoy, mm -hmm. and just the psychology of humans and how to persuade them to make buying choices and buying decisions. It just mm -hmm. fascinated, for, fascinated me personally. And from there, it was just lock and load. I was like, dude, this is what I want to do. Switched my major, and it's just been history ever since. Now, do you think, was college beneficial for you? I mean, obviously, from what you said there, it provided some great value in helping you find yeah. your, um, I guess, path sure. uh, into business. But yeah, yeah. in the broad space, from what you see now, in this day and age, right now, because that was like four right. or five years back. Right, for sure. Back. Um, is college still worth it? What are the pros and cons? Um, I think, I think college is worth it if you're a person who's going to a profession where you need a certification. So if you're an accountant, if you're trying to be a doctor, if you're trying to be a lawyer, you're trying to have a real professional career mm -hmm. that needs a certification and has a true end goal, I think absolutely college is necessary. I think for people who are in professions like communication, business, and um, training different people and different things like that. To be 110% honest with you, I don't think college is necessary. All of the marketing skills that I learned in my business skills was learned from me building a business in college and going through that process. Mm -hmm. And that's why my success has been a lot quicker than most people because I was going through the school of hard knocks during college trying to build a business and not knowing how to do it at all. You know, so I think to the person who's trying to get certified or trying to have a true career in some type of field, absolutely. I think if you're a person who kind of knows what you want to do and you're a self-starter, and I want to stress self-starter because you can't not go to college and not be a self-starter. You're going to fall wayside. But if you have the discipline, you have the mentality to get things done and you know that you're a winner and you're going to get to that end goal, I don't think it's necessary in this day and age. So it basically kind of comes down to the person, I guess, and like where they want to pursue. A lot of it's personality, for sure. A lot of it's personality. A lot of it's just DNA. Um, a lot of it comes down to being that self-starter who's going to put in the time because half the information that you can learn is online right now. Right. I mean, the way marketing and business is changing, it's changing so quickly where these, these, these institutions and these colleges literally can't keep up with how fast everything's changing. So it's almost more beneficial for you to learn everything online. And I'd rather hire a person who's, I could care less if you're going to college or not if I'm hiring you. I'll hire a person who's gone out and learned a skill set via online where there's Facebook ads to learn how to do video, all that type of stuff over a person who has a former degree who hasn't really gone out and done anything.
So it's that's kind of my my take on it more than anything. Nice. Yeah. I'm just gonna move the mic just a little bit. Yep. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Cool. Um. So, right after college. Yeah. Did you? Did you go straight into business? What? How? What? What path did you take right after? Did you know what you wanted to do? Um. Yeah. For me. Yeah. I did know what I wanted to do. So for me, I had the the e-commerce business that was rolling, the raking business. So for me, I went straight into that business. I was working at Sports Chalet at the time. I was getting $400, $500 paychecks, working at Merkin minimum age. I was funneling that cash into the business. Probably about three months after that, I went out and got an office space and I was straight into business. I was rolling. I was trying to get more deals, get more customers on the platform. I, I just knew what I wanted to do. I was itching to get out of college. College could not end quick enough for me because I was like, dude, like if I'm achieving this much with being in college, the moment I get out of college, it's over. I'll be honest with you, dude. I didn't even want to show it to my graduation. Like as soon as I finished my last really? class, yeah, I didn't, dude, I was over it. I just said, dude, I'm done. I want to move on. I need to start hustling because I got goals, dude. And, and that was my mindset. So I went straight into running my business. We got an office space. And we just kind of started building from there. And that kind of was the, the process that we, we went through. Nice. Yeah. So you were saying you were working mm -hmm. um, in obviously like just a job, typical just a job, job, yep. sales job yeah. um, at a company. For sure. Um, selling shoes, right? Selling shoes, dude. Sports LA. I was hustling shoes. And I was one of the best salesmen there. <laughs> but that gave you experience, right? Oh, it gave me huge experience in sales because I had to hit certain quotas, you know? Mm -hmm. So going through that process where we had to hustle shoes, then we had to sell insoles inside the shoes. So I was learning about upsells, how to convince customers of certain things and kind of going through that process. So it was a uh, it was for sure a learning experience, but I wouldn't change it for anything. Right. And it definitely led me to where I'm at today with the skill set that I have. And I like how you also said that you took that money and put it back in to your business venture. Oh, 110%. Dude, I reinvested everything. You didn't spend it on oh, any ridiculous not, dude. stuff. I'll, I'll, I'll eat shit, dude. I'll, I'll sacrifice everything for what I'm trying to achieve in the long term. And that's just where I, that's where I was at that moment in time. That's where I'm still mm -hmm. at. Now that that's good because yeah, absolutely because a lot of people, especially when they're young, for sure making money, yeah, um, buying some ridiculous stuff, spending on some stuff yep. that you don't need, none of it. Especially when you want to follow like a business venture for sure on the side, yep. Uh, reinvesting in yourself and in the business, right, is the best way to grow it, yeah. Um, because it's the long term play, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, a lot of it is lacking self discipline, and a lot of it, a lot of young people, young entrepreneurs, you know, and people that are listening to this podcast, a lot of us get fascinated in the cheese and trying to chase the cheese and chase the Instagram posts of me riding around in a Porsche and the whip and doing all this type of cool stuff. Mm -hmm. That's not the game I'm trying to play. I'm trying to play such a bigger game. I'm trying to win, you know, I'm trying to build an era like the 93 Chicago Bulls or the 09 Lakers or an Alexander Great reign for over 12 years or JD Rockefeller reign for over 50 years and built one of the largest companies that came with sacrifice. And if you're not willing to sacrifice and eat shit, you're not built for this game. And that's the honest truth. And I think that the, the quicker that you can learn that, the quicker that you'll move further and really, really holding those emotions and, and really blocking out the, the minutia and the bullshit of what Instagram and what all these people that we look up to in the lifestyle, because I was in that. I, that's what I originally thought. And until you can kind of solve the mindset problem, you're never going to grow your business. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the most under, the most under appreciated things as an entrepreneur is mindset. And it's one of the biggest things that you could ever work on because that's when I saw exponential growth. Gotcha. Yeah, absolutely. So now you left that job, right? And you're pursuing raking at this point. Yep. This is where your, I guess, interest in fashion, culture, and business collide. Yes, 100%. So can you tell me and, and kind of like 
bring me through that process and how you started raking and and brought it and made it into a business? Yeah, hundred percent. So the original idea with raking was when I started that business back in I think like 2012 or 2011, somewhere around then. That's when. Um, Instagram was really getting big. That's when you saw Nikki Diamonds on Instagram and people were loving him, the hundreds. Um, a lot of these big brands, um, Pink Dolphin, mm -hmm. a lot of these brands were growing huge Instagrams and that's the way that they were being found. And for the consumer, the consumer saw that these brands were living a certain lifestyle that that was almost envious for a lot of these people. And when you bought that product, when you bought Diamond Supply, you were buying into Nikki Diamonds. When you buy Live Fit, you were buying into that lifestyle. And I understood that at a at a at a very visceral level. And I said to myself, well, what if I was to create an online store where we could combine the shopping experience with the lifestyle experience? I always believed that the lifestyle was the fuel to fashion or any major brand, especially with the video community and how that's so big, building the lifestyle is everything. That's how you build a brand, not a not a company that competes on price, you compete on value. So what we did was we created a website where basically we pulled in all the Instagram feeds of, let's say we were selling Diamond Supply, we had all of Diamond Supply's products and we pulled in all of their um, lifestyle images via Instagram. You could like it, you could follow different brands, and we really wanted to build a cultural platform to pull people in. We weren't competing on just, oh, buy this product at $19.99. I wanted you to buy the lifestyle, and that's what I've always believed in, and I've always believed in brand. And that was before I even knew I was a marketer, I was doing that. You know, it just almost became so innate to me where I saw the lifestyle as the conduit to push this company forward, push these brands forward. And that's how we closed a lot of these deals on getting these brands into the store because we weren't able to be in a, a brand, especially 19, 20 years old, bro. I'm walking up to these these booths at Agenda Show, trembling in my pants like, hey, I'm a, I'm an online retailer. Will right. you guys please sell to me? They're like, yeah. dude, get the hell up out of here. <laughs> and my first time I went to a trade show, I was trembling, dude. I, I didn't get any brands, you know, and that's where I had to start build, start to build confidence and start building a, a real concrete mindset. Mm -hmm. And um, then I kind of wised up and I said, well, if I tell them that I'm a market them, show the lifestyle and really get these these consumers bought into the brand, which is going to lead to more long term revenue that's when the door opened for me. And that's when I started to get all these brands and started really to move the business. So it was, it was a process. So, um, throughout that, we, we built up that brand and, um, right after I got out of college, I needed to get more brands mm -hmm. and we started working on trying to get, you know, even bigger brands. We try to get the hundreds and different companies like that and really trying to bring these companies on the platform, which was huge. You know, so that kind of started the process more than anything. Nice. And you were saying that you were going out there trying to get these brands. Um, obviously, yeah. there was some fear in there at first, oh, right? Oh, man, you have no idea, dude. I mean, I'm telling you guys, like, I was one of the most self-conscious, shy guys you would have ever met. I mean, if you knew me in high school, dude, I was not the guy that you see today. Introvert, right? Yeah, absolutely. 110% mm -hmm. I'm an introvert. 110%. Same. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that was a very tough time for me to really have to break out of my shell and force myself to go through the fire and almost rebuild myself was one of the most painful processes I've ever had to encounter but it's one of the most rewarding processes that I ever had to do. And I think that for the people listening, I just had such a emotional attachment to the belief of me building a big business and building a big company that that emotion overdrived the other emotions of fear and forced me to push past that. And I think anybody who's trying to achieve something, you have to have an emotional attachment to what you're trying to do. You have to. That's why Steve Jobs says, 
You have to love what you do. Emotions are one of the most powerful things that we were we were given. And if you can attach an emotion to what you're trying to achieve in life, you're gonna fight that much further for that goal. Mm-hmm. And these little obstacles become nothing. You're gonna plow through those things. Yeah. You know, so attach emotion to the end goal and watch you start crushing these objections and things that come your way. You know? That's powerful. It's huge. Was there um was there something that kind of switched or was it a progression over time? It was a it was a progression over time, but for me it was a chip on my shoulder for sure. Yeah. I always felt that I was always second. Yeah. I always felt that I was second place and um, it was it was a chip. You know, for me, my fuel feeds off of wanting to compete and prove. And I figured out when I was younger that that was one of the most powerful emotions that I had. It was like throwing coal on this engine. Mm-hmm. And once I kind of got into that mindset, Drake calls it sicko mode. Like once you get into that just <laughs> sicko mode mindset, uh-huh. it's like, dude, I'm gonna prove you wrong at all costs. There's nothing that you can do to stop me. Mm-hmm. And I will beat you. And I will crush everything that you ever thought of me. Mm-hmm. And having that, like I said, having those emotions of wanting to prove yourself is one of the most strongest emotions that you can ever have. Mm -hmm. It's huge. Right. You know, so that was a mental switch that pushed me through those times where I said, damn, dude, I don't think I can do this. Or fuck, dude, I'm so shy. And it was, I would just have this mental conversation with myself like, fuck that, dude. You're one of the best in the game. You're going to be an absolute goat when it's all said and done. And that just triggered something in me. And I just said, fuck it. Let me pull up my pants and let's go. Yeah. And that's how I kept it pushing. Right. Because yeah. I think for a lot of young entrepreneurs out there, um, especially ones that are introverts, mm-hmm. you're going to have to go out there and yeah. talk to companies. You have to. Representatives of companies. You have to. Whoever else. Yep. Network. Yep. Um, it's just part of the game. You have to. Yes, if exactly. you want to get to where you want to be, you have to. Exactly. And so I think you know what you said there was good because... It's basically came out of necessity. You're, it's necessity. You're, you're back against the wall. Yep. Where else do you have to go? You forward. have to, exactly, forward. For, that's it. Yeah. You know, you have to be willing to endure pain. And a lot of these entrepreneurs now, they have no pain tolerance. Things get tough and they get so mentally bogged down with, damn, I can't get this or I can't get that. You have to have a, you just have to have a no bullshit mentality. Like this is going to get done. Mm-hmm. There's days where I'm like, fuck dude, can I really do this? Everybody has those days, mm-hmm. but I attach so much emotion to what that end goal is going to be where it's like, dude, I just flipped the switch and that's right. it. And I'm hitting it, right? you know, and regardless. And I think if entrepreneurs can really, like I said, attach the emotion to the goal, embrace the darkness when it comes to people doubting you or why you want something. A lot of entrepreneurs don't want to embrace the darkness. Mm -hmm. A lot of entrepreneurs want to say, oh, I don't want to do it because of the money. Be real with yourself. Do you want to do it because of the money? Embrace that feeling because I bet you it's going to fuel everything you want to do. Mm -hmm. Oh, I want to build a business because I want to prove something to somebody. Embrace the darkness because most people are afraid or it's not it's not socially accepted to say stuff like that. Embrace that emotion, harness it, put the coal into the furnace and burn that motherfucker up Mm -hmm. and let's go. Mm -hmm. You know what's funny? I I heard this. I forgot who who said it, but um, failure goes along the lines of fear. uh, Fear of failure. Yep. And someone said, instead of looking at failure as kind of like a one one and done type thing look at at it as more as experimenting like he he made the analogy or he compared it with scientists right scientists they experiment and they go through failure but they mark it down as data absolutely instead of failure it's data data points oh my god absolutely i mean that's that goes along the same lines of entrepreneurs i mean dude you're gonna fall 50 times and probably get one win 
but that one win is going to be so great. Most people aren't going to forget the 50 failures. Mm -hmm. You have to be that guy who's willing to fall on your face 50 times before you get the one W Mm -hmm. in the W column. So are you willing to do it Mm -hmm. and have that real conversation with yourself? Because if you're not willing to do it, then don't sign up for this game because this game isn't for you. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to eat shit. You have to willing to be. I always come up with this analogy, dude. It's like if you ever seen Alexander the Great towards the end of the towards the end of the movie, he's conquered for 12 plus years and he conquered all the way into India. And this is one of the last crusades that he wants to basically conquer. And basically his, his, his squad basically said, dude, we can't do this mm-hmm. anymore. We're tired. We're, 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 we're lost. I want to go home. I want to go eat. I can't do this anymore. Mm-hmm. And Alexander the Great took off his, took off his armor and he said, show me a man who has more scars than me and we'll quit right now. And what that tells you is you got to be willing to go through the fire and fall 50 plus time, take the punches, the bruises, the scars, spit the blood out your mouth because we're in a game that's that's a 48 minute game. So you're either going to make it for for the full 48 or just don't even start. Mm-hmm. And that's the that's the nature of this business. And it's a grueling business. So you got to either want it or you don't. Yeah, you know? it's, I mean, and there's, I there's, there's fun times. There's times when Absolutely. like you're, you're, there's highs and super lows. Mm-hmm. And I guess, uh, if you're, if you're willing to go through the roller coaster oh, and, man. and, and embrace the roller coaster, man. I mean, it's just, if you love what you're doing, you love what you're doing. Absolutely. And, and the highs that you're going to get are some of the greatest highs you'll ever feel, man. I mean, talk about euphoria times 10, mm-hmm. you know, but you got to be willing to go through the valley to get to where you want to go. Right. You know? So I want to talk about the point in time okay. where you had to make a tough decision yeah. for Raken. Absolutely. Right? There was um, a lot of money on the table yep. offered for yep. the company. Absolutely. But what happened there? Like, did you take it or, or you didn't? No. So we didn't end up taking the money at all. So, this it's, was to buy out Raken. Yeah, so this was to purchase Raken to have a full-fledged partner within the company. So for us, um, I remember I was telling you guys about Karma Loop. Yeah. So Karma Loop was a two hundred million dollar company, was absolutely killing it in the game, and I remember reaching out to the CEO of the company, and this was a guy that I absolutely idolized for years. I studied him, and he was one of the one of the people that I really built my entrepreneurship tendencies around what he did. And I study his moves. And um, I remember sending out an email to this guy like, hey, check out this commercial for my company. We're doing this. We're doing that. We've had this type of success, yada, yada, yada. And um, just sent it out and thought that, you know, maybe I can connect with the guy and maybe he can see something in me. I didn't really think about it or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So about two months later, I get an email from Greg. He's like, yo, I love what you're doing. I want to hear more about it. And I damn near fell on the floor. I'm like, dude, the dude that I was studying in college hit me up like, bro, I want to know more about this. I'm like, what the fuck? Are you kidding me? <laughs> and um, so I remember um, I remember basically we uh, we talked about having a meeting. Yeah. And um, the meeting kind of fell through. And I remember hitting him up again the second time, like, yo, like I'm trying to have a meeting and he's located in Boston. Mm. And I didn't hear anything back from him the second time I hit him up. And it was like maybe seven days later and it was like three o'clock PM on a Monday. And I remember looking at my email and he was like, yo, Kenny, I'm in LA right now. Can you meet at the Mondarin hotel in the next three hours? I was like, oh fuck, dude, this is huge. Are mm. you kidding me? Yeah. And I was like, fuck, dude, I had to drop what I was doing. I really had nothing prepared, you know, and I was like, yeah, I'm absolutely meet you. So I ended up mobbing down to the Mondarin Hotel and um, I remember texting him and waiting for him. I waited for him probably like an hour. I'm like, dude, is this guy going to show up or is this dude bullshitting, man? So I remember he showed up to the hotel 
and I just kind of put on a face and I was like, yo, Greg, what up, bro? I'm Kenny. He was like, damn, dude, what's up, dude? How are you? And he was with Jermaine Dupri. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jermaine Dupri, obviously a music artist who did music with Bow Wow and stuff like that. Yeah. And I was already kind of, you know, starstruck. I was like, shit, but I can't act like it, <laughs> you know? So he was talking to Jermaine Dupri for a little bit. And um, so after that, I'm like, yo, you know, let's rap. And um, so we end up sitting down and talking and um, I ended up just spilling it to him like, yo, this is my business. This is what I've done. This is what I've accomplished. Yada, yada, yada. And I told him straight up to his face. I'm like, Greg, you wouldn't sit down with me to have a meeting like this unless you saw something. So let's just keep it real. And he said, bro, 110%, I see something. I think that what you guys are doing is absolutely dope. And I would love to basically, you know, be a part of this company and, and definitely invest in it. Mm-hmm. And... Um, you know, after that meeting, I couldn't tell you the emotion that I felt from that moment, from going from a kid who was 19 years old, not knowing shit about this business to having one of the goats of the game basically affirm me and say, dude, I love what you're doing. It was just surreal. Right. So after that moment, you know, we drafted up contracts and different things like that. And um, he threw um, some numbers at us. Mm-hmm. And um, I was talking to my partners and different things like that. And the numbers just didn't make sense for us. Mm-hmm. You know, for the amount of work that we put in and different things like that and what they were offering and how they wanted to restructure the company and different things like that, it just didn't make sense. And mm-hmm. it was one of the toughest decisions for me to make that decision. And for me to put all the chips on me, you know, because we could have easily got that deal done and and I could have moved forward with him and, but it didn't feel right, you know, and it's one of the craziest things for me to sit here to even say that, you know, but my intuition told me it just wasn't the right deal and it's just sometimes just how it goes, you know, but it's crazy to, to, to see things come full circle like that for sure. Right. So like, I just want to like, go in your mind Mm -hmm. at that point um obviously it didn't feel right yeah but um it's it's a big decision when you know you're offered you know money for your business for sure it's something that you built for sure something that you have strong ties to it's like your baby 100 percent. you know um what was there was there something i mean obviously it just didn't feel right but was there something specific that you know you just were like I, I know this is something more and I and I want to hold on to it. Yeah, exactly. It was, you know, he wanted to turn our business into a media company where we produce content. Mm-hmm. We started to produce a lot of content at that moment in time because I knew that content was was huge and that was a way yeah. that we could get a you know shit ton of people interested in what we were doing. Mm-hmm. But he wanted to get rid of the e-commerce side of our business and basically build that on his own but Mm -hmm. he wanted to acquire us for the skill set that we had and different things like that and that just wasn't at that moment in time for me it just wasn't what i necessarily wanted Mm -hmm. and it wasn't what our partners and what we worked for and what we wanted Mm -hmm. you know so it just didn't align with what i wanted at the end of the day and i kept going back and forth with that decision yeah because I was like, damn, dude, I got an opportunity to work next to this guy, even even if this business isn't exactly what I wanted it to be, I can still say I work next to this guy, get the clout, and take that on to the next venture that I'm gonna eventually build. But just for me and the way that I was built, it didn't feel right, and yeah. um, I just didn't move forward with it. Yeah, you know? I, I think that's good. I mean, because that's someone you obviously respect. I 110% respect. I idolize the guy. Right. And so you obviously had to make the tough decision, mm-hmm. but you knew deep down that it was the right decision. 100%. Um, and you were not just like acting out of, you know, out of all emotions. No, you know? a- absolutely you not. Have to, you have to be focused and then push emotion to the side yeah. when it comes to those deals, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, when it comes to those type of deals, you have to, like you said, you have to push the emotion away because the emotional side of Kenny would have been like, dude, let's get the deal done. I'm with my idol. I'm going to put this on Instagram. I did it. I made it. And I would have did it for the clout. And just for the way I was thinking, I had to put those things aside as hard as it would 
and truly look at the black and white data and look at what my end goal was and put a pencil and draw a line from where I'm at Mm -hmm. to where I want to be. And if the line doesn't touch the two dots, I'm not doing it. Right. And it was, it was, it was a tough decision, but you got to separate those to separate those emotions when it comes to any type of contract, whether you're negotiating for a deal, whether you're negotiating for, you know, a long-term deal, whatever the case may be, you have to always look out for the best interest of yourself. And for other people, maybe the best interest would be in a deal like that because they're thinking differently than me. But for me and what I wanted at that time, it didn't align for me. Right. You know? Yeah. And, and that's important. And that's just something that you have to do and move on from there. Yeah, for sure. So, um, let me see. Did the light change? I think so. No, we're still good. Yeah, we're solid. We're still good. Um, marketing. Because yeah. you... I mean, you've always been a, into marketing, always been a marketer, right? Yeah, Especially absolutely. through Raken, right? Yep, absolutely. Um, obviously, you're still running Raken, right. but you're also still working with your mom's business, right? Yep. Because you're still in both worlds at yep, the same absolutely, time, absolutely. providing your skills. So how did you, I guess, transition as a marketer to where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. So when I was in the raking business, we had a lot of cash flow issues. Mm-hmm. So I had to solve those cash flow issues quickly. I I just got an office. I was looking to hire different people, different jobs I was trying to do. I was trying to produce a lot of video content that cost a lot of capital. And I had to figure out a way in which I could build this business with, with what I had, the resources that I had. So during that time, the one skill set that I knew that I was extremely good at was marketing because I had to build a massive audience. I had to get people on this platform. I had to do um, think about creative video ideas and different mm-hmm. things like that. That was the crux of me building everything I built on. It was all built on marketing. And one day I just had this epiphany. I'm like, dude, what's the one skill set that I have that I can easily uh, sell to somebody to get some cash flow to fund what I really want to do? So I ended up starting a marketing agency called Flight Marketing. And um, I ran that agency. And what we focused on was doing Facebook advertising for small businesses. And what we did was we would create Facebook ads, we would drive leads, and we would drive sales for different companies. Mm -hmm. And I started building that business up to some pretty substantial revenue. And that business was the almost the float to what I was trying to build on the media and culture side of the business. And I suggest everybody, if you're, you know, in a business or you have a dream that you're trying to achieve, most of us, ten, nine out of 10 of us are having cash flow issues and we're right. not going to admit it, mm-hmm. but we're having cash flow issues. So how can you leverage your skill set to put cash in your pocket so you can build the business that you're trying to build? You know, and I, that's one thing I preach to all my friends. And that's one thing I'm like, dude, you need to build a side business that can fund what you're really trying to do, because that was the one unicorn thing that I did that kept this whole train moving. And I had to think on the fly and I developed that skill set, and I've been running, running with it ever since, you know? Right. And, and I'm glad that you brought that up because this is where I want to segue into the creative space, especially for freelancers, those that are in video production, um, and any type of creative style of business. Um, the thing is the, here's the fact, like in that type of business, it's project to project. Absolutely. And in between you're not getting paid. Absolutely. So how, because from what you were saying, it's a stream of income. Absolutely. So how can these individuals that run a business, whether they're freelancer or not, gain some stream of income to fill those gaps and even add to the project income that they're getting. Oh, 110%. I think that everybody, especially with videographers, a lot of videographers don't know that they have an extremely unique skill set. Most of them sat on YouTube, watched millions of videos, trying to figure out 
how to basically hone in on their craft and they're extremely good at what they do. But a lot of them have the lump, the lumpiness in their business where they're getting deals and there's that lull time between those deals that which are a couple of weeks and you got to still put food on a table and and eat and do different things like that. So one thing that a lot of these videographers need to do is they need to start selling their um, knowledge online. And when I say that is you've learned an amazing skill set in creating video and you're a lot further than the normal person who's just getting into this business. If you can create a online course and sell your information where you take a person who knows absolutely nothing about video and get them up to speed where they can go out, start filming, do different cuts and different things like that, and you can sell that course online for $297, $597, or $997, you can have that cash flow running in between those lull times, which is huge for a person who's a freelancer, who's going from job to job, who needs cash in their pocket. And it's looking at the resources that you have that most people overlook. You don't have to be the amazing Steven Spielberg with the amazing track record who's sitting on this mountain. All you gotta do is be two steps ahead of the person that you're training mm -hmm. and you're considered the expert. And taking your knowledge and turning it into a product and selling it is really how you can build cash flow and really help yourself get through those low times for sure. Now for someone that's like, oh, I'm, I'm not good at teaching. I mean, I don't know about speaking in front of the camera. Right. Um, you know, obviously you've done courses before and they've been successful. Sure. Um, so like, what is like, one tip that you can give that can help someone that has that barrier to just start teaching an audience. Yeah, absolutely. I think one thing that you can do is a lot of us look at a blank canvas, a blank PowerPoint or a blank screen and not know what to teach. I think we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just have to see how the wheels built and add our own flair to it. So one thing I suggest is going out and looking at what other video courses are out there where you have certain videographers who've created courses, see what they do, see the structure of what they built. And from there, just basically build around what they've already done, but add your personality, your flair to it and keep it simple. It doesn't need to be the kingdom come type course where, you know, you add all the bells and whistles and different things like that. Like I said, all you need to be is two steps ahead of somebody and the knowledge that you have is absolute gold, mm -hmm. you know, so keep it simple. Look at what other people have done mm -hmm. um, prior, create a simple outline for what you want to teach these people. Don't overthink it and film it one or two times and that's it. Stop going over it. Put it out. You're going to see what people like, what they don't like, optimize it mm -hmm. and keep it pushing. And there's some sites uh, for that, like just hosting um, courses, right? Yeah, absolutely. So you can look at sites like Kajabi, which is amazing. Teachable, which is what I use. Um, those are some simple sites where you can easily mm -hmm. upload a course and basically put that together and, and sell something that, you know, other videographers would absolutely love and, and eat up for nice. sure. Right. Because there's, I mean, people can always say that, oh, there's so many courses out there for video, for photos, things like that. But in reality, um, you know, people don't take the course just from like what's in it specifically, I guess, because it's pretty much similar in a sense. Like let's say for video production. Right. People know that they're going to get lighting Yep. They're going to get audio mm. uh, tutorials, mm. things like that. But I think it's who's teaching it exactly. that differentiates it. Exactly. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, you can look at all the gurus out there, Gary V to Andy Frisella to Lewis Howes to all these different cats that are out there. And they all are trying to get in front of an entrepreneurial audience, right? But the one differentiating factor, and they all are doing around the same thing. But the one difference is Lewis House talks about business completely different than Andy Frisella. Mm. Andy Frisella talks about difference completely different than Grant Cardone. And there's certain people that are gonna that are gonna vibe with certain personalities. Your uniqueness 
is the um, value proposition to your course. The way I teach something, the way that I approach business is vastly different than the way somebody else approaches business. Mm -hmm. And there's gonna be people that connect with me that are different than people that connect with you. Right. Double down on who you are, double down on the way that you look at things in your worldview, and you'll be surprised at the people that wanna connect with you. Nice. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's, that's very important. Huge. Because I think a lot of people kind of have a negative look at courses yeah. nowadays from what I see Absolutely. just because obviously the, everyone seems to have a course right right but in reality everyone doesn't have a course from like what people seem like to think because mm -hmm. there's a lot of ads popping up they're getting like oh get my course get my drop shipping course get right. my you know photo course whatever right, right for sure but um in reality it's not that many i mean no and I in fact there's a huge audience out there on the internet right. that can consume it. Absolutely, guys. Yeah. I mean, you got to remember there are 1.2 billion people on Facebook. You sell a $500 course to, let's say, a thousand people, you know, you're well into the six figures. You're going to be all right. You know, so stop looking at, well, there's everybody else selling a course. You just need a thousand people at a thousand dollar course, or you need, you know, 200 people at a $497 course. Stop looking at how big the ocean is and just look at how many fish that you need. Take those fish, cut them up, and feed yourself. Right. And, that's and, the end and, game. and it becomes comes more, I guess, I guess the size of the audience also plays a big role because you're not trying to focus on a wide spectrum, right? It's because, like, there is that, uh, I, I'm not sure if it was a book or something, but A Thousand True Fans. Yep. Um, by Kelly, I forgot. I'm not sure what the name is. Um, what are you talking about? But yeah, okay. and um, he basically talks about having just a small, strong, engaged audience that will continue to um, just eat up your content. 110. You know, eat up whatever types of products you put out, uh, yeah. as long as you're providing value. Uh, yep. Yeah, because the courses are just a small part of what you should actually be doing mm -hmm. because you should be obviously be present in like, let's say YouTube, mm -hmm. providing more value through there, mm -hmm. um, providing value on Instagram. Mm -hmm. But with the courses, that's an ability to monetize, 100%. right? So as long as you, you know, you're creating a space of value giving, yeah, exactly. right? you'll have an audience. Oh, 110%. And like you said, you just need a thousand people. And those thousand people, if you serve them the right way, they will continuously buy from you day in and day out. Look at some of your favorite stores that you've been to. I love Apple. I will continue to buy Apple laptops mm -hmm. for as long as they make them. Right. So if you double down on creating, you know, an extremely good course, amazing value, and really pour your heart and soul and want to actually help people by actually helping people, mm -hmm. you will be surprised with the results that you get. Get a thousand people, 500 people, that's all you need. Like I said, there's 1.2 billion people on right. Facebook. Right, You know? And and like, for example, mm -hmm. um, what you're doing yep. with Carla Dennis and Associates, yep. you're providing, the company is providing value through its media channels yep. to its audience, right? Yep. And so at the same time, you already have, you know, that audience, that email list of people that are receiving value. Yep. And so when, when you created that course, yep. you have a place, an audience to provide it to, mm -hmm. and they're ready and willing. Oh, yeah. But it takes the time to kind of build that up, build that audience, you know, which is, you know, it's yeah. what it should be. Yeah, so it, it's, it, exactly. it takes it's time. It's right. a, that's, yeah. that's anything it's a process, in life. just it's like not, anything. It's not a get yeah. rich type deal where it takes two seconds to do this. I mean, anything that's going to produce a substantial amount of revenue is going to mm -hmm. take time. Right. And like I said in the beginning, are you willing to go through the fire? Are you willing to battle and have the scars on your face or don't sign up and do it? Right. And it's that simple. Exactly. You know, so yeah, exactly. So what we're doing for the... Um, Carla Dennison Associates business, we created a course called the Tax Reduction Strategy Course, and that's really my baby. And um, basically what we did was um, we found a niche online where we saw people that needed to set up a profitable business foundation, 
get their taxes in line, know how to pick the right entity. And we taught a course on teaching them how to basically do that. And um, since we've done that course, it took us about a year to really perfect it now. And now that we've built that course and now that we're really starting to hit sales, you know, we're doing about $25,000 a week, you know, and we can easily scale that up to hopefully to start doing $100,000 um, a month. So like I said, it's such a scalable business in the cr uh, course creation business to really build that and use your knowledge and skill set to educate people and have that as a side income to float you through those moments mm -hmm. where you're not getting those deals, you're not getting those contracts on the video side, but you got a booming course business that is absolutely killing it for you. Right. You know, and it's huge. Yeah. And obviously there's a lot of things that goes into having a successful course, you know, such as marketing and things like that. Obviously you're an expert yeah. and I mean, you can talk about that for days, but at oh, least, absolutely. at least from what you provided, um, hopefully that will kind of like broaden the the horizon for those that are trying to figure out, um, you know, how can I make some extra income in between projects as a freelancer, 100%, you know, for example. 100%, absolutely. So I think that's great. Yeah, uh, it's great huge. advice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's huge, you know, and especially, you know, like I said, there's lumpiness in being a freelancer. You need to develop a side hustle to get you through those moments because that's going to fund you getting new equipment. That's going to fund to make sure you, your rent's getting paid so mm -hmm. you can focus strictly on your craft because you're losing focus because you're still like, dude, I got to get this money. I got to get this money. You're in such a panic attack mode where you can't create at your best. Mm -hmm. And when you get into that moment and that Zen where the your needs are taken care of, mm -hmm. you can truly produce the greatest work that you possibly can. So let's get that solved and you'll be surprised at how far you get in the, the level of work that you produce as well. Right. And you know, some things that I've seen um, besides courses that other videographers have done, um, for example, they have... Um, you know, like sound effect kits that they yeah. created. Um, they have um, color grading kits yeah. that they created. Things yeah. like that that they can sell. Effects. Absolutely. I know I, I, a lot of effect Huge. kits Absolutely. That, that they that they sell. I mean, I've purchased some. Yep. And um, and it's it just made my job easier. And you know, you those things like that. You you can. There's different avenues as a creative type person, especially as a videographer, that you can take to um, make extra income. I mean, you see it out there, people do it, so it can be done. 110%, yeah. you know, you just gotta get creative on, one thing that you have to do is you really have to look at yourself and look at the skills in which you've acquired. And it took me a long time to figure out that, oh shit, dude, like I really know this marketing stuff. And it's almost like you're looking for your cell phone and you forget that's in your pocket, you know? So you really got to focus and pay attention to what have I done in, in my craft that I can turn into a product to sell, to get through those lumpy periods. And you know, you might do that and that might be a huge profitable business where you're like, dude, I want to keep growing this thing and do the video thing. And if you can set that up, that's the, that's 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 God level mode. That's when you're really moving. That's when you're really moving. That's when you're really making cash. And it's a beautiful place to be in. Yeah. Yeah, man. Speaking of creativity, yeah. um, obviously you're not in, I guess, just a traditional artist space. I mean, you're an artist in your own right. Yep, absolutely. But um, you're not like, let's say, a videographer by trade nope. or a photographer. Um, but you're still an entrepreneur 100%. and that's art in itself. So yeah. how do you stay creative as an entrepreneur? Man, you know, for me, I just study so many different businesses and it's almost like imagine my, I, I almost imagine myself being a basketball player. And if I was a basketball player, like, like Kobe Bryant, I would study the Michael Jordans. I would study the Wilt Chamberlains. I would study all of these great goats and take certain aspects of their game, utilize them, see what works, what doesn't work, and try to perfect the process. And for me, that's what inspires me, the art of taking from what others have done 
and re-whipping it and creating something that's truly my own, that has my own personality into it. You know, and for me, the art of this game is marketing and figuring out how can I persuade an individual to purchase my course or how can I get them to watch a video or how can I get them to act on what I'm trying to achieve in the end goal. And the fascination of just that art form and studying so many different things and studying what others do, it's it's just how I stay creative and how I really just continue to, it's just, it's just the love of the game, dude. Mm-hmm. I just love the game. I love the sport. And I think that you find solace and creativity just looking at what others do and appreciation of what others do. Right. And you read a lot. Oh yeah, well, right? I, re- I read. Because I, I know you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What What is like? A, is there like a recent book or a favorite book that um, you've read that you provided know, some impact? Yeah, for sure. I would say a recent book that I read um, would be The Principles by Ray Dalio. It's definitely a well-known book at this point, and um, I just think that that book has had a substantial impact on me in establishing different principles in the way that I live and my rules of my life. Because as an entrepreneur, you can see so many different things happening on Instagram and real life and on TV where you think, oh, this is the way that it has to be or that's the way that it has to be. And the moment that I started to trust myself and develop my own principles and my own rule book and started writing my own playbook is when I started to really take off and started hitting Alculades and started playing my own internal game. And I think that Principles is a great book for people to read, for people to understand Ray Dalio's principles and the way he lives his life and how you can start building and writing out your own principles and writing out what how you want to live your life and the way that you want to trek the path that you're on, which is huge. Nice. nice. Yeah, man. Yeah, reading, reading books is, is really good. And I know for a lot of people, mm-hmm. you know, reading and sitting down, especially for me, like for sure, it, it takes time and it does. And uh, I think the one great thing nowadays yeah. is audiobooks. Oh yeah, audiobooks are amazing, dude. I mean, the inventory that I have in audiobooks is stupid, you know. Yeah. But I think I, like I make a lot of analogies to sports because I'm a huge sports fan, and I think that reading books and taking courses and getting better is the same thing as Tom Brady sitting down and watching film. If you're not willing to sit down and be in the film room for three, four hours a day and spend that time to get better, to read your opponent, to study the players, to to really hone in on your craft, you're not ready to be great. And that's okay. Accept it and eat it, and you'll be mediocre. But if you're willing to study the game film watch film religiously like the ghosts did and the greats did, then you're going to see, you know, your, your success take leaps over people because most people aren't willing to do that Mm -hmm. at all. Really? Yeah, exactly. You're investing in yourself. Oh, 110%. It's the greatest investment, dude. I mean, I've spent so much cash on different courses and, and books and learning. And like I said, I was never the smartest dude. And it comes back to having that chip on your shoulder. I know that if I'm putting in the time and, and putting so much information in my brain, I'm that much further than my competition. And when it comes down to it, I'm going to beat them because I put in that little inch of effort mm-hmm. that when they didn't. Right. You know? And so I guess when it comes to courses, yeah, I mean, you've invested in courses, Choose. I've invested in courses, and it's for the benefit of our craft, right? Yeah. And, but for someone that's like, mm, the course is a little bit too much. I don't know. I, I, I can't, I don't want to buy it because I, I'm not sure about it just because of the price tag, right? Um, but you know the value that provides. So um, obviously there's benefit in it, right? Yeah, but I course. guess you got to think about it like you're investing in yourself. It's like schooling. 110%. In a way. 110%. I mean, Life's a life's a mirror. If you're not willing to invest twenty five hundred dollars in somebody's course, there's customers that aren't willing to invest twenty five hundred dollars when it comes to you creating a video. Life's an absolute mirror. So you have to understand that and look at the ROI. There's there's no there's no limit on the amount of money that I'm willing to invest in myself because I've doubled down on myself and I trust myself that much in the work that I've put in 
that I'll take that course and 10x my return on my investment. Mm -hmm. So stop looking at the cost and looking at what the long-term benefits are of it. And it goes back to long-term thinking. Right. You know, which is huge. Nice. You know? So um, why do you keep doing what you're doing? I just, I love the sport, dude. You know, I absolutely love the sport. I love marketing to the nth degree. And for me, you know, it's not so much about the money. It used to be for me. I've gotten money. I've had money now. And it's it's not everything. And for me, it's about the story. I want to build an absolute legacy, build incredible businesses and have people 30 years or 50 years from now talk about the story of Kenny Dennis and what he achieved and how he was willing to pour into so many people because he was just a good man. That's that's where I'm at and that's where I'm trying to go. Um, I'm chasing the story. That's the end goal for me. And I'm chasing the impact that I can have on lives. And that's really the 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 beacon at the end of the hill, mm -hmm. you know? So if you have any advice for your younger self, something yeah. that you know now, yeah. what would that be? Be patient, dude. Stop trying to fucking... Stop trying to think everything's going to happen now. You know, be patient, play your game, stop getting so involved in what everybody else is doing and seeing what all the rest of these people are doing on Instagram and how they're having success so easily and different things like that. Trust yourself, trust the process, continue to put in work, play your own game. It's going to work out because all those people that achieved it so quickly you're going to eventually outpace them. Mm -hmm. Continue to put in the work. Trust yourself. Play your game. It's all going to work out. Nice. That's it. Yeah, that's powerful, man. Yeah, man. Absolutely. I like that. Uh, yeah, me yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Any future plans? Um, Man, so right now, you know, I'm focused on really building out the course. So for the tax reduction strategy program, that's a huge course that we're building out right now. It's a $1,500 course. And um, scaling that up to do about $100,000 a month. I'm really looking to do um, a million plus next year. That's my overall goal. So that's going to be huge for us. And um, looking to basically start some more businesses, man. I want to get the course business up and running and kill that off and uh, eventually start a few more businesses. I'm not sure what I want to dig my teeth into, mm -hmm. but uh, things are good. But it took a while to finally get here and uh, I'm excited about it. Nice. Yeah, yeah it's man. focusing on one thing at a time and making sure you have it dialed in until you move to the next. Exactly, right? dude. Stop getting the shiny object syndrome, you know, and focus on a million different things. Do one thing, do one thing right, and the rest will take care of itself. Beautiful. Yeah, man. So thanks again. Dude, thank you for having me, bro. It was incredible. Yeah, yeah this is awesome. A lot of great stuff that I got out of Absolutely. you just now. I mean, I learned a lot as well. For sure. So I appreciate that. Appreciate you having me. Yeah. Signing out. Peace. My man. <laughs> My man. <laughs> We're out. Thanks again for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I'll be placing Kenny's social media links in the show notes so you can stay connected. And if you got great content out of this episode and know someone that can benefit from it, please share it. So thanks again for joining in. And until next time, I'll see you in the next episode. Peace.